So yeah, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And I see, um, okay, so there's in, in the second um, window saying Malit. Yes, uh, good Hi. evening. <laughs> My name is Jospin Malit. Jospin. I'm the mother of uh, Keldin Malit, uh, mother-in-law to Veselina. I'm a teacher by profession. I handle a primary section. I teach English, maths, and uh, science. Yeah, I'm happy to join you. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for joining. Um, okay, I know um, almost everybody has introduced themselves. If there's if there's anybody who would like to, um, you know, in, in the next um, couple of minutes, please do so and then we'll, we'll begin. Um, so I've seen Echezona, um, JP Murunga, welcome, Mabel, hola. Uh, Milagro, welcome. Richie. Um, you have the option to unmute yourselves just as you do to mute yourselves because we understand that we'll all respect, um, we'll all respect the, the ambience by, by taking care of our background noises and, and, when we, and, and our voices when we speak. So we've, we've left that to you. Um, Richie, would you like to say something? And uh, Milagro, and then we can start. Um, or Milagro, would you like to start? Yes, uh, hi. Well, I am happy to join this. I like the topic a lot. I um, met Vaselina, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, in the first, my first time in Paris, I, I am Peruvian. I to I see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's super nice to see you and I read uh, what you post, and I found really interesting uh, the subject, so I'm, I'm joining. I am a social psychologist as my background, and I work now at AVAS, uh, an advertising group in the digital team, uh, in the coordination of all the local teams. So, super interested to, to, to be here, and thank you for the welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you for honoring Veselina's invitation, and you would be our first Peruvian on the call. Ah, good. <laughs> Selena setting records for us all round. Diversity. <laughs> Diversity. Um, so I know Beatrice had her hand raised. Maybe you'd like to say something, Beatrice? Thank you, Marwa, for letting me know. Hi, Ogini. Welcome. All right. Um, what I'm thinking is that let's all mute ourselves and keep ourselves on mute. And has Beatrice, Beatrice, did you start to say something? Okay. And there will be, there will be definite opportunities as the, as the session goes along to introduce ourselves and to further network. Um, Thank you for allowing us to start um, later. We know that Zoom was asking a lot of people for up, uh, to update their um, settings. So we thought we'd give a little bit more time to, um, to everyone to, to be able to join today's important conversation. So I'll start by introducing myself. I am Zaina Kanbai. I am the founder of South South Women, born and raised Kenyan, proudly and passionately African. And I live my life by three values, love, peace, and freedom. And I live my lifestyle by three pillars, care for self, care for enterprise, and care for community. And, is, and it is within the context of, of, of those um, values and those pillars that um, South South Women came to be, including in the form of an observation when together with my husband in our company, we were bringing business leaders together um, across the global south to um, engage with one another as peers and as possible partners as opposed to our stereotypes or the stereotypes we have of one another. Um, we recognized that women with the same capacity as men, intellectual, financial, uh, creative and otherwise, 
were slower stepping up to the opportunity to engage with each other for business or for enterprise or impact projects or even for experience or wisdom sharing. And South South Women was born and is now um, an international network of conscientious women and men from the global south engaged in wisdom sharing and impact work around the world. And our intention is to influence a culture of acceptance, inclusion, and integration. Um, what I want to say is that if anybody has an issue with um, the, the pace at which I or any of the other speakers are talking, please let us know in the chat. And also if you require any form of translation, okay? Um, so looking at the world today, uh, I think as we celebrate Madaraka Day or Liberation Day in Kenya, and as we, as we uh, you know, take a glance at what's going on, um, the, the importance of our unity and our progress um, together is um, far, more, far more relevant and important now probably than it ever has been because this is happening now in our lifetimes. Um, so learning across cultures, um, bringing ideas together that help us to grow ourselves better, to build our enterprises better, and we consider family an enterprise. It is something that we put a risk into developing and creating, and we invest heavily in it. Um, drawing on knowledge, ideas, and experience from people around the world while we, we focus on topics that, um, that help us to do this, is what our wisdom conversations are about. And so the online platform is, is really about that. Um, and today's conversation is about emerging and future trends in enterprise and how we can navigate them from the perspective of two influential resources on the subject. And I will be introducing them shortly what I'd like to do before that is introduce Marwa Kasem, who is our Director of Lifelong Learning at South South Women. Um, and she's going to take us through our um, values and our code of honor. So you get a sense of, of um, what you are, what we are together creating and participating in. Marwa is an educator at heart and has been delivering workshops for over 16 years to about or more than 10,000 people across different countries, across 14 different countries. Everyone from high school students to teachers and to CEOs and country directors. She came to us with the reference of being the, the best trainer that um, Airtel Africa had experienced. Um, she's an Egyptian and she's a learning consultant for leadership and life skills. Um, and a subject matter expert on emotional intelligence and public speaking. So Marwa, I hope that introduction does you um, a little bit of justice. There's so much more to you. Um, so please, if you are available, because um, I've kind of lost you on the screen, um, to take us through the values and the code of honor. There you are. Thank you, Zena. And hello, everybody. So great to have so many beautiful, smiling faces uh, with us who are keen to make this world a better place. Um, I'm going to start with sharing our three values at South South Women. Basically, we work with inclusion, firstly and foremost. We work with anybody, anywhere who's keen on making this world a better place. We accept everyone and we create a safe, uh, 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 an environment of safety and security. And what we mean by that is basically psychological uh, safety and security where everyone is welcomed. And we know that when we feel accepted, then we bring forth the best of ourselves uh, to wherever we are. We work with a code of conduct that embraces honor. And what we mean by honor is we always try to do what is right for our planet, whether it is for humans, non-humans, and of course the environment. Um, to do that, we work with a, a code of honor where we stand for each other and never deride each other. And we hope to walk the talk with that. As the great Maya Angelou said, know better to do better. And we believe that right now we are on the precipice of really a world where we need to all be better. And in order to be better, we uh, start with the foundation of respect and trust. We speak the truth and we seek 
to understand um, ourselves and each other so that we can truly make this world a better place. We're here today and joined by two amazing influencers in their own right, and we're very eager to see how we can make enterprise um, in all its aspects really prepared and design it so that we can build this better world that we all seek. So thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Zina, for that uh, amazing introduction. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to learn together today. Thank you so much, Marwa. And um, just before we go into the introductions of um, Danny Stone and Veselina Kracheva, I would like to welcome a few other people who have joined in the conversation. Um, I can see... Um, Hagar, Hagar, welcome. Marion Zomo, who is our, um, uh, Marion Zomo is the, the equivalent of the Minister for Agriculture for one of the largest agricultural producing provinces in Kenya. She thank has, you, uh, thank you. Thanks yes. for being here, Mary. Do you want to quickly say something about yourself? Um, maybe for those ones who are meeting me for the first time, uh, I'm Marion Zomo. The, the County Executive Committee Member for Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives. An entrepreneur at heart because uh, my master's is in entrepreneurship. And a, and a very stern believer of, uh, very firm believer of what we are going through as South South women. There is a lot I've learned from the presentations which have been done here. And I believe I'll, I'll get to learn much more. And uh, I've worked with Zaina and Ustor for a long time. They're big hearted people with a lot to offer. And uh, together as a team, I'm sure there is a lot we can offer to each other. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Mary. And once again, to all the Kenyans as well for taking time on our public holiday to be here. Maria Mercedes, hello. Lucia, hello. hello Nancy, hello. thank you for joining us. Lucia, um, from the south of Argentina, right? And um, yes. I'd also like to extend a very, very warm welcome to um, Ambassador Dr. Josephine Ojiambo. And um, among her, her many, many international um, accolades and attributes, um, Ambassador Dr. Ojiambo um, has provided at the level of the UN um, incredible input um, as Kenya's ambassador to the UN to the whole South-South vision and movement. She, in fact, um, was the ambassador who led the entire team of South-South um, uh, ambassadors at the UN during her time there. Um, I know you have been um, wanting to, to join us for some weeks now, and we really, really do appreciate that you've taken the time today to be here. Um, I, I personally know um, just how busy you are, and it really means a lot that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, and we don't Thank have- you. Any... I'll just say a, big, a quick hello. I'm just Please. getting in, so I'll give you a visual in about five or 10 minutes as we continue with our conversation. Perfect, and then we'd love to hear yeah. from you as okay. well. Thank you. All right, lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Zaina. And hi, Salil. Good to see you. Okay, so if, if there's anybody we haven't honored and acknowledged, you have the chat to, to let me know and um, we will be more than happy to, um, to, to do that. It's important to us, um, as is your participation and contribution. So as we were saying earlier, today's conversation is about emerging and future trends um, in enterprise and how can we navigate them. And we have this from the perspective of two people that um, many people consider influential resources on the subject. Um, I'll introduce them both together because I know that um, part of what they say is going to feed into the other. And so they can, um, you know, when, when um, Veselina finishes, Danny, Danny can pick it straight up. Um, so Veselina is Bulgarian, married to a Kenyan who, um, we, we just heard from um, Malit. Um, she is a seasoned director with a background in strategy consulting, business development, and economic research. 
And before heading the Kenya office at the Oxford Business Group for Business Intelligence and Advisory Operations, um, she managed research, negotiation, and consultancy roles in Ghana, Mongolia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Germany, France, and Bulgaria across multiple sectors, including media, marketing, and manufacturing. On a personal level, I am consistently and continuously impressed by Vaselina's thought-provoking questions and her thirst for information to help solve the world's problems. Um, I'm grateful that she occupies an influential role setting industry standards for equality, sustainability, and empowerment. It's such a pleasure for me to have you here, Vaselina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zaina, for this introduction. And you made me feel a little bit old, but other than that, uh, thank you very much. And I'll let you introduce Not old, experienced. <laughs> <laughs> Not old at all. Um, and Danny Stone, who is um, an entrepreneur, uh, so let me say this first, Jamaican born in Canada. <laughs> So representing Jamaica in Canada, um, Danny Stone is an entrepreneur, a coach, a speaker, an author, a teacher, and the founder of the, his newly established School of Success, which is an online school for entrepreneurs. He also has a new podcast show called Grind and Gratitude that helps people level up their lives and their businesses. Um, he has personally headed training and development for some of Canada's top 100 companies. Um, what, one of the things I personally love about him is his community activism, which he does for a movement called Zero Gun Violence across Canada. He also co-wrote a, um, a book last year with nine other uh, black Canadian men, Are they, were they all black Canadian men, called New Me, New with the K. And it's stories of overcoming challenge which reached number 13 in the Amazon book category just last month. So my conversations with Danny have always left me with smart, uh, applicable tips to achieve. I think he has a way of building confidence from trustworthy humility and, and humility is actually what I appreciate about both Danny and, and Veselina. So thank you so much for being here today. And um, just before you start, just before you start, I'd like to welcome um, Immaculate Maina, who's also a pioneer influencer of South South Women. And she is the um, equivalent, again, of the Minister for um, Agriculture in Nakuru County, which is another um, very uh, prominently agricultural producing um, uh, province in, the, in Kenya. I think we have a screen share that we might need to... Vaselina, have you started sharing screen? That wasn't me. That wasn't you. Okay, so um, Maro, I think we need to check that. Um, so welcome Immaculate, thank you for being with us today. Um, okay, Vaselina, I think we're good to go. So remember everyone to please keep yourselves on mute. Um, and you can share anything um, that you choose to on the chat. All right. Well, thank you very much, Zaina, for this uh, introduction. It's really a pleasure to, to be meeting all of you today and to be among friends and family in this discussion. Um, I hope to have the opportunity today to share with you a few questions, to share with you a few small theories I have, and also just look into where we believe the world is, uh, is headed uh, based on some research that I've done. Again, Zaina mentioned that I'm a researcher by profession uh, and a manager, so I do experience some of the problems that you have experienced so far, and I'm hoping that we can connect on that and, and see where it leads us. So I have done my small presentation, The Impact Age, and I'll talk to you about the small theory. And the idea here is to express a few thoughts about the future of enterprise. And uh, since we have all been quite stressed around COVID times, I thought I'll start with the elephant in the room and talk a little bit about uh, some advice that we have seen around how to cope with COVID. And from there, uh, take more of a bird's eye view into uh, how we can adapt in the changing environment that we're experiencing. So when it, when it comes to COVID advice, we've all heard some very good things. I'm going to reiterate just four points that I found uh, most interesting and, and repeating themselves across various sources. 
So you would get a lot of advice to be prudent, to cut costs, to make positive and lasting changes for your organization. This is basically a good advice at any point, so I'm putting it out there. Right now in the current situation, you would be told that it's a good idea to rethink and pivot your work as the rules of the games have changed immensely. And I'll talk to you about, again, why this is a, always a good idea. Now with the short term planning, we're seeing, we speak a lot about planning in scenarios and being ready to switch gears on short notice. And finally, don't panic, you can do this. And uh, even for that, I'm, I'm happy to give you a few examples of why uh, you're more than equipped to do that. First of all, as a humanity, we have been asking some big questions of ourselves for the longest time. And interestingly enough, now more than ever, it is important to come back to those questions in those very stressful times to take the bird's eye view and decide where we headed and why we headed that way. So I'm going to start with the smallest big question. What is the meaning of life? Um, when we talk about the meaning of life, and please, before you roll your eyes uh, at me, I'm going to tell you why it is important today that ask yourself the meaning of life. First of all, you have some control of your situation. And honestly, this is a very unique time in, in human history, because for most of the time in human history, we, we have not had this control over our situation. We haven't been able to change our situation. And you might be thinking, oh, but you know, I'm bombarded with events that are out of my control. I feel helpless. There are thousands and millions of miniature problems that come up every single day at me. So how are you telling me that I actually have control? Well, the truth is that uh, most of the human population right now is above the poverty line, is able to uh, perform some small acts of choice, and is even able to create crossroads where you actually are, uh, help create your own options. So with that in mind, again, this is crucial because if we don't have this prerequisite, then there's really no point in asking for the meaning of life. It's more of a theoretical exercise like for the Asian Greeks who first started uh, delving in those questions. And then the second thing, is it's actually a very good feeling to know where you're going. And don't get me wrong, you don't have to know your end direction to be able to make progress, to have a feeling life. But even if your target is moving, even if later in life you come up with a different solution, uh, knowing where you're going is just a very fulfilling exercise, which is why uh, it's good to answer that question. Another feature is that whatever your answer to this question is, it will always be correct. So even if you come with a new answer, which you believe is better, your previous answer was still correct and because it let you come to that conclusion. So whatever meaning you find as humanity, because we don't have a, there might be a right answer, but we don't know about it. And since that is the case, whatever you come up with will always uh, be correct. So that's a very, um, positive thing in terms of, of how you're going to feel again. And finally, I have more, more of a personal reason within this conversation to ask you to think about the meaning of life is because um, in terms of what my belief is of where the future is going with the future of the enterprise, namely the impact, what I did, the impact age, this will be the most important question of your career. All right, starting there, I'll let you all think about a little bit uh, about the future of, of, of what your life is about. And then uh, as we do that, I'm going to mention some of the key trends that we're experiencing in today's society, which will hopefully assist uh, in, in some of those answers. So one of the major trends we're seeing, and this is what I really want to highlight, uh, is automation. And this is transforming life in many different ways. I wanted to give you just a very brief overview of how automation came to be and what it means today. So we have quite a few participants from the agriculture sector. So the very first uh, step in terms of uh, transforming jobs uh, to a profound degree has been the introduction of agriculture in human life. So from hunters and gatherers, we turned into farmers. The next step was the industrial revolution. And again, I know I'm not saying anything revolutionary, but it's, it's good to give you the context of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about job transformation. So the industrial revolution basically turned us from, from farmers to manufacturers and people with uh, engineering jobs, creators. It also, to an extent, gave us the ability to come up with thinkers, philosophers, and more of those, uh, you know, large scale uh, productions. Then the next stage that we're currently finding ourselves in, and again, I skipped through a lot of history there, but just to kind of help you see the context, is the information age. And here from manufacturing jobs, we basically switch to service jobs, which is where our economy is currently found. What I call the impact age, then we'll have to transform the service jobs to something else. And uh, my idea here is to talk about uh, impact jobs. 
when we're talking about the information age where we currently find ourselves, and there's a reason why I put tools, machines, and AI into the uh, equation, we're in a very interesting time where up to now, all the job transformations we have been seeing have been such that they do destroy a lot of jobs, but they also create a lot of jobs because the main objective is to make our jobs easier or make some very boring and uh, jobs we don't like, basically eliminate them by introducing automation and machines to do them instead of us. But now we're entering a stage where we're basically teaching our machines how to think, which is the basic um, premise of what we believe human value is. And seeing that this is happening, this means that a lot of jobs will be uh, destroyed, which we're seeing already, without necessarily immediately creating new opportunities. So as, human, as humanity, we really need to rethink where we're going and what we'll be doing. And there's a whole plethora of, of social consequence that I'm not going to delve into a lot of detail, uh, whether we're talking about potential universal basic income, uh, with the idea that every person will be paid a basic income, uh, knowing that the creations that we do today are building on a large body of creations that happened before. So whoever is doing anything actually uh, is making use of the human resource that uh, has happened in the past. So that's one idea that will come. Whether we're going to get into a situation where basically a small minority is going to own a lot of the value uh, while the others uh, are there backing call and trying to figure it out. Whether we're going to have a rise of the robots or other anxiety-inducing um, implications of, of the social change we're seeing. But the truth of the fact is that this is already happening. The machines are already replacing jobs. With COVID, we saw that accelerate to a huge extent. So for example, uh, an example that my husband uh, gave me just as we were discussing this topic um, is that if you were um, a person-to-person -person insurance sales uh, man just as COVID started, your job is gone. Right now, people are really getting used to the idea of, of uh, buying online. So this is just one example where you're uh, your job can be eliminated very quickly, so you have to find something else to do, uh, which still still gets meaning. And on a larger scale, to so show you how AI in general uh, eliminates jobs uh, to a very different degree than, than what was happening before, is we have the situation where, for example, project management software in uh, Silicon Valley uh, can basically remove the, part, the middle management jobs within a company, and as it does so, it can learn about from the experts that it is managing and find ways to eliminate even some of those jobs, thus creating more um, productivity with fewer human resources necessary, which on one side is a great thing because this means we can be more productive with less resource being inputted. On the other side, it really makes us think where are we going and what are we, uh, what are we going to do in the future when the, all those jobs are gone. So this is the big dilemma that we wanted to discuss. Now, to look into that, I also wanted to come up with a few trends that we can, um, we can discuss with you today. And some of today's big trends, again, when we're talking about automation and AI, what I spoke to you already about earlier, we have virtual robots which are learning to do your job. They're much faster than you, which means that those repetitive manual jobs that don't bring meaning to your life are not going to be uh, in existence very soon and also are not going to be a sustainable way to, way to make a living. Then we have a lot of those quick to market innovations uh, which are transforming sectors very rapidly. The good thing is that you can be one of those quick to market innovations so you can definitely go and rethink it, a sector. We're in the information age, the information is available, uh, a lot of the resources will be available to you which has been, is, again, is unprecedented in human history and also means that large corporations are no longer necessarily a safe haven. So you don't really need to think that, you know, if I land myself into a large corporation job, then, you know, I'm set up for life, that's good. Uh, in fact, again, if we're moving to the impact age, impact is what is going to give you job security rather than uh, the size of the corporation you work for. Then there's the ubiquitous funding. And again, this feeds into the quick to market innovations uh, situation. We have a lot of crowdfunding, angel investors, crowdsourcing, and other sources that uh, basically allow you to uh, come up with create new things very quickly. We have ease of transaction. Again, very typical trend that allows uh, you to reach 
customers um, and partners across the board. Uh, we have mobile money, online banking, which uh, especially in the African context has been revolutionizing in terms of uh, distributing wealth and is uh, going to continue doing so. When we're looking also at the global supply chain, here we have the idea of uh, jobs being exported to other places, uh, meaning that if uh, experts are available in another place, uh, then they can easily take over jobs, also creating opportunities for people in um, more faraway communities. Again, Africa has been a marginalized continent for the longest time. So this, this feeds into that narrative that uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to pick up from here and, and use some of the jobs. Again, we're seeing some interesting things specific to COVID, which is the idea that um, people are looking to maybe localize their supply chain to a big extent. Uh, and Kenya is doing that as well to some extent. And uh, hopefully that's going to have a long lasting benefit uh, for the country and for other countries who are attempting the same. Uh, with again, the idea that uh, security and in terms of the new COVID situation, health security as well, uh, might play a bigger role than in cost in that. And as things become cheaper to do because of automation, this might become more and more possible, namely keeping the value creation jobs within the community where the value is going to be then exported. Further to that, we have a lot of respect and belief in the importance of entrepreneurship and SMEs. Again, that has not always been the case. And in Africa, we see a lot of hype. Now we're talking about uh, SME building, we're talking about women in business, we're talking about equality. Uh, so all of these new values actually uh, are going to transform the way that uh, the jobs are going to happen and which groups of people will get assistance to be lifted to a good level. And a very interesting phenomenon I wanted to speak about, which uh, might not seem intuitive at first as something that is really changing the way that jobs are shaped. This is the growing awareness of global problems. So we are talking about um, poverty, we're talking about uh, pollution, we're talking about all those huge issues that as individuals, we might not necessarily be able to find solutions to. Uh, we can take some measures to, to help alleviate, but it's more like a, a whole society needs to deal with them. The reason why this is important is because as a society, we're slowly starting to realize and believe in the idea of altruistic egoism. And altruistic egoism basically means that the, the profound belief that whatever you do to help others will actually come back and help you in return. And in reality, in our world, this is really the case. And it has been the case for a very short amount of time, which is why it's so counterintuitive. Because before it was a situation that the pie was basically the same size, it was never changing. So if you wanted to, um, to get more value, if you wanted to get more, a better standard of living, you had to go to the neighboring country and, and fund the, and get some of the resources from there so that you could then put it uh, to use within your own country or company or et cetera, et cetera. But now we're getting to a situation that the more people are outside of poverty and, and the more people are educated, the bigger the pie becomes. So there's the more um, possibility for innovation, that there is the more possibility for solving those large, large scale problems that, uh, that are important to our long term survival. So in, in the long term, the realization slightly, very, very slowly sinks in that we live in an era where helping those in need is actually the best thing you can do for your personal success. And not only in terms of fulfillment, but in actual improving of your life condition. So having this, this, all these thoughts in mind, this is what led me to, to talk about the impact age and the idea that um, our measure for success in the future will not be um, how much hours you spend into a specific project or how much products you produce, because this is going to be the machines doing that. It's going to be to what extent are your actions contributing to the success of humanity and to what extent, to what extent are your actions contributing to uh, alleviating global problems. And I'm very happy to be talking just in the wake of, of the first commercial aircraft being uh, sent to space with, with astronaut, astronauts um, just uh, this week. Uh, because again, it's, it's a very exciting time in, in human history when um, some of the values that we have only dreamed of as, as utopian basically are coming to reality and, and able to work together. So now the question is, what is the meaning of your life and how does all this fit into what you personally have to do with yourselves? And uh, for my, and again, I'm not 
not an, uh, an expert in that area, so I'm just going to throw some thoughts at you and I'll be happy to get your feedback on, on how this relates or doesn't relate to you. But basically, I came up with a few different categories of what your life can be about and what the meanings of life can be. And again, it's something that can keep changing. It can be to a much smaller extent and to a much smaller degree defined uh, than, than what I'm suggesting here. But the idea is figuring out what works for you so that you can uh, then start guiding your decisions around that. And Danny is going to talk quite a bit about, you know, how to leave your corporate job and, and go into entrepreneurship, which is, again, something that uh, might be the way for you to, to fulfill um, the, the meaning of your life. So I have just put out a few different categories of what you can be in your life. So they're the creators, and these can be people who just like to leave things behind uh, as the sense of, art, music, writing, products, so design, um, or just new ideas that come in and help progress humanity. You can be a craftsperson, so these are the people who basically help make these ideas reality, so it can be again engineers or <clears throat> people who help basically progress certain projects to fruition. You can be ambassadors promoting certain ideas um, and doing with your actions, whether it's product development or uh, services or etc. Uh, being able to to promote ideals that you're passionate about. You can be a healer, and I'm not only talking about the doctors. I'm talking about people who are trying to, let's say, alleviate poverty or trying to heal some of the problems we have created as humanity with its pollution, etc. Uh, etc. Et so it can be anything else. These are some of the, the ideas I wanted to put out. So in the interest of time, I don't want to take much more, um, but uh, I know we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, so I'm just leaving a few questions for you to think of. So I'll be very happy to hear from some of you what kind of meaning you're looking to find or have found for yourself uh, that guides your decisions in, in, in what way. Uh, also, please do challenge my assumptions and contradict some of the suggestions that I have put out, and feel free to ask for clarification. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for the silent clapping. I almost feel like a doctor now. <laughs> Annie, you're muted. Zaina, we don't hear you. You're still muted. So, Got you now. Okay, yeah. So, Asante Sana. And that's uh, for everybody who is not Kenyan to learn. When you want to say thank you in Swahili, which you may have seen in The Lion King, and if you haven't seen it, Asante Sana. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Can I you <laughs> integration of the um you know of the of the spiritual with the scientific of the of the altruistic with the you know with the with the self-interested and i and, and it's just such a brilliant perspective that you brought to this conversation thank you so much and i've already seen some questions coming up um but what we will do is let danny um take on and we'll address them all from there All right, can everybody see my screen? All right. Yeah, we can. Great, thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, Zaina already introduced me. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, a speaker, and a coach. And um, I talk to, actually, I coach a lot of um, small business owners and entrepreneurs. So I'm going to be speaking from that perspective in terms of, you know, the future of work for individuals, for entrepreneurs, small businesses, medium-sized businesses. So I like to start with this quote, and uh, I like this quote because it says, you know, to be successful, you have to have your heart in your business and your business in your heart. And that kind of speaks to what Veselina was saying, like, you know, why are you doing this? So I meet so many people who just want to start a business to make money and their heart's not in it. And, you know, usually within a few months or a year, the business is dissolved because they just, they just weren't, they just never had their heart in the business. So. I really like this quote, and uh, that's why I wanted to kind of start with that. So today I'm just going to talk to you about a few things. I'm just going to talk a little bit about me and my background, 
because it, it actually relates to uh, what Veselina was saying, like the meaning of life. So I'll tell you a little bit about my journey into entrepreneurship and how I started coaching entrepreneurs and teaching. I'm going to talk to you about three trends and some of the things that you can be doing from an entrepreneur's perspective or from, you know, a small business or um, medium sized business perspective, and then I'll wrap it up. So a little bit about my journey is uh, I, I grew up here in Canada in a sort of what people would call a poor community. And um, I was surrounded by a lot of drugs and crime and you know, there was a lot of violence in my neighborhood. And, you know, in seeing that, um, I never saw a lot of people who left the community to come back to the community um, as role models or mentors or, or those types of things. And, you know, I was really headed down the wrong path. And it wasn't until, you know, I found mentors and people that believed in me that told me, hey, you can go to university um, you can ha have a good job, you can give back to the community, you can be an example. And so that's what I did. I went away to university. I left, I, I studied commerce. I left university, came out and got myself a quote unquote good job in the corporate world. And uh, I started uh, managing training for some of Canada's top 100 companies and doing a lot of coaching, um, professional development, employee development, those types of things. And what I realized after having my good job is that I just didn't want to be in the corporate world anymore. Uh, I saw a lot of sick leave, a lot of stress leave. I saw, you know, a lot of um, mismanagement. I saw a lot of good people getting let go uh, with no real justification. And I thought, you know, this corporate thing isn't for me. And so I decided to start um, a consulting company, a training and consulting company on the side. And then eventually that got to the point where I could leave my full-time job and run my business full-time. So I had a small training company and I had about four or five employees working with me and we were going out and we were landing some pretty big contracts uh, with engineering firms, with you know, education uh, sectors and lots of different organizations. And then eventually I realized, you know what, um, I don't want to work with big companies. I'd rather work with individuals uh, who are transitioning into entrepreneurship or small businesses or medium sized businesses. And so I decided to kind of transform my business. And, and now what I do is I help people turn their passion into profit and make a greater impact in the world. And so for the last seven years, that's what I've been doing. I've coached and, ta and taught and trained, uh, you know, almost a thousand people and help them sort of do what they love for a living. And so I love that Veselina was talking a lot about, you know, finding your meaning because that's what I kind of help people do. I help people to find more meaning and purpose and use the skills that they have in their passion to make a greater impact in the world. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about me so that you understand where I'm coming from in this. Um, so I went from that to um, writing two books. I wrote my first, first book about seven years ago, You Have the Keys Now Drive. And as Zaina said, um, New Me just came out uh, the beginning of this year. Um, myself and nine other black men wrote this book. Um, to inspire young boys and men around the world. And it's really been getting a lot of buzz in Canada, in the US. And as Zaina said, we reached number 13 in one of Amazon categories. Um, I'm also a speaker, so I've been speaking all over the place, um, different countries about various topics. And then recently I just opened my school, the School of Success for Entrepreneurs. And the reason I'm telling you all of these things, because all of these things are where, um, the knowledge economy is headed, whether it's, you know, self-publishing books, whether it's speaking or consulting, and then online learning. So I kind of just stumbled into all of that and realized that. And uh, as a result, it's been, it's been great because in twofold, one, I've been able to make a greater impact in the world. My first book reached uh, readers in nine different countries. Um, and also, you know, it's a great way to um, build a legacy and to help other people build their legacy. 
And so that's where I'm seeing some of the trends going when I'm talking about entrepreneurship. So the three trends that I'm kind of seeing with, with work and business and entrepreneurship um, are this. The first one is the knowledge economy. Now, the knowledge economy is really selling information or knowledge or courses. And right now, you know, there's a huge trend in the, in the knowledge economy and you can see it. You can see it with companies like Amazon. You can see these big consulting companies. And so from you, for you, from a perspective, what type of knowledge can you sell? What type of information can you put out to land potential clients and customers? So this is something that you can start thinking about. And I want to talk to you about a few of the things that you could probably do right now. So the first thing, consulting. We all know consulting is huge, right? You look at Accenture, um, $43.2 billion in revenue in 2019, right? What are they doing? They're selling information. They're selling strategies. So if they can do that, then you can do that, right? Um, 449,000 employees. And what they do is they sell solutions and knowledge and information. So that gives us an indication that this is where the economy is going, right? So how can you get your piece of that? Again, LinkedIn bought lynda.com. So lynda.com was a, a, a website that just sold courses. And they'd been around for, I think, about 20 years. And in 2015, LinkedIn bought them for $1.5 billion. It's now called LinkedIn Learning. So this is, a, this is somebody who started an online school just teaching in the beginning, just you know, Microsoft training and so on, and expanded their learning catalog to the point where LinkedIn bought them for $1.5 billion, right? So I'm saying all of these things for you to start thinking about what can you do, right? So maybe you can design a course. Maybe you have a program. Maybe there's other things that you, other types of information that you can sell um, to supplement your business or as a business, right? So this is something that we can all start thinking about right now. The e-learning industry is expected to be $325 billion by 2025, right? $325 billion by 2025. That's huge, right? That's, that's big for all of us. We all have knowledge and we all have information what most of us don't have is the way to package that up and deliver it and, and market that to other people, right? So that's the, that's, the, that's the thing that most of us need to learn how to do. How do I take my knowledge as an engineer in insurance, in consulting, in strategy, in people development, and put, package that up and deliver that so that people want to buy from me? That's, you know, $325 billion. We all have knowledge that we can sell. Um, I was recently, recently working with one of my clients who um, he has a guitar business. And basically what he does is he teaches people how to play guitar online. But he has a monthly membership that people pay. And right now he has about 249 people in his school. So he's making about ten to $15,000 every month teaching people how to play guitar online, right? So that's that's how you take advantage of this, this massive industry. Uh, what about Amazon, right? I just told you guys about my book on Amazon, um, the book that we just released, how we, we were ranked number 13. Well, Amazon's making about $2 billion off of books. So how do you get your piece of that? Well, it's easy to upload your book to Amazon. What you do is you have your transcript, you upload it to Amazon, no cost to you. Amazon approves your book, they start printing it. And, and when somebody orders it, they ship it out for you and you get your cut of the money. You get 70%, Amazon gets 30%. So you can become a part of this economy as well, right? Um, I know another guy, what he does is he does short eBooks. The eBooks are about um, 25 pages long and they teach different things. And so what he does is he actually doesn't even write the books. He comes up with the categories, he hires somebody else to write the book, he uploads them to Amazon, and he's making about, I think, about $4,500 a month of all the books that he has on Amazon, right? So these are ways that we can start to take advantage of that, right? 
He's not even writing the book. He subcontracts it to somebody else. They write it. He sells it. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. So Veselina talked a lot about um, automation. So I want to talk a little bit about automation, but I want to talk about it from the standpoint of, you know, entrepreneurship and small businesses. What can you do to automate your business to make your life easier? So you're focusing on the right things. Okay. So one of the things, and this is, you know, you, many of us may have seen this, but chat bots and auto auto responders. So, you know, when you go to a website and a little pop-up says, you know, pops up and says, how can we help you? Right. A lot of us have been to websites and we've seen that. And so that's one way that you can have auto responders. People can pop up. It says, you know, you, you pre-populate it with answers to questions that people are most likely to, to ask. And that way it takes away that kind of human element and they don't get to that human element until they have more deeper questions or, they're, they're interested in buying your product or your service. You know, a lot of emails. Now you look at Google, uh, Google, you can set up uh, in your Gmail, you can set up auto responders for certain types of things. So the great thing about chatbots and auto responders for your business is that it increases efficiency. It increases the speed of service. It reduces the touch points of your business. Um, it also in increases the customer experience, right? um and speeds up their buying decision and there's nothing worse than somebody coming to your website or looking for information and they can't get it and there's nobody available to give it to them right so what what they're going to do is just leave but when you have chat bots and auto responders i think this is great because it interacts with your your potential customers and that in turn increases sales so you know these are things and some of these are are you know, minimal cost. Some of them are free, depending on which ones you're using. But auto response is, is really great. And having those preloaded responses are, are, are really helpful. Another thing we're looking at is all in one solutions, right? So you have solutions that track inventory, automate shipping, um, connect with your clients, sales, accounting, you know, you have these all in one software systems, which really make you know, the life of an entrepreneur or a small or medium sized business really easy. It eliminates a lot of duplication of work. Um, it helps you to track your inventory. It helps you to connect with your clients and your customers. And so you can do everything from operations to sales and marketing to accounting to finance. It allows you to do all of those things and all in one. And some of the small systems that you, you can try are um, Infusionsoft. Um, that's a really big one that, uh, or um, HubSpot, Infusionsoft or HubSpot are, are a lot of system, are big systems that um, a lot of small and medium sized businesses are using right now. And what about sales funnels? Um, my, in, my sales have increased by about 65 to 70% once I started using sales funnels. So sales funnels work like this. You have some type of awareness, whether it's um, you post something on social media or on your website, or you run an ad online, just not trying to sell anything, just making people aware of your product or your service, right? Then they, they give you their name and their email, and then they get into this sequence. And now you start to segment them. What are you interested in, right? Then you start to evaluate if they're going to be a, a good potential customer or client. You can sell them something, they purchase it, and they become a client. And that whole process can be automated. So what, I've have, what I have and some of the systems that I have is I run an ad on Facebook, um, asking people, are they interested in starting their own business? They give me their name and their email. If they say yes, they get entered into a, a sales funnel. They get invited to an automated webinar, which I pre-recorded, and then they just go anytime they choose. At the end of that webinar, there's a sale I offer, I make a sales offer. And if they choose to say yes, they purchase and then they get access to the course or the program that they want. So that's how kind of like the sales funnel strategy works. 
And so that's the future. That's where things are going, right? That's, that's where a lot of organizations are going. They're going through this automated sales process where it's very hands off. The customer goes through this either alone or with very few touch points and sales are made and you literally don't have to do much, right? So there's lots of different sales funnels out there. There's click funnels, which is a really big one that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs are using. Um, but there's lots of other, uh, other uh, sales funnels out there. And then working remotely, like a lot of us understand the working remotely, um, but this crisis has really caused organizations to look, take a look at if they are equipped to allow people to work from home. So I have two of my friends who are working with major banks here in Canada on work from home strategies because the banks are actually moving towards, uh, you know, the bricks and mortar, having, you know, 50,000 people in the office building and starting to set people up to work from home. The challenge is that they weren't equipped. So when all of this happened, it was a scramble for them to try to, to, to set people up to work from home. And so a lot of us who do work remotely or want to work remotely, there's things that we have to consider for ourselves, right? Like, is your, how, is your home set up? A lot of us want this location freedom, right? And I know me, sometimes I, I go to Starbucks to, to meet with clients or just to work from Starbucks. Um, I have a home office. Um, sometimes when I'm traveling, I, I have to make sure that um, the places that I'm staying have really stable internet because when I'm traveling, I can still work from anywhere. And so that location freedom, that's, that's where, the work is, where the world of work is going. It's going to allowing people to work remotely. And so what does that mean for you, right? What does that mean for organizations? Organizations like it because one, it reduces your commute time to work. One, the other thing is it reduces a lot of stress and so on. People have more freedom and flexibility to work within their day. And there's a lot of research that shows when people are able to work from home or from a different location, they actually put in more hours and more time. And so organizations have been resistant to this for a long time, but now they're starting to see the benefit and the costs that they can save by allowing people to work remotely. The other thing is like integrated meeting and productive systems. So this is where, you know, Zoom, I, I don't know if a lot of, a lot of you have saw, seen what Zoom recently put out, but since all of this um, COVID has happened, they have went from, I think it was 200 or 150 meetings a day to 300 online meetings a day on Zoom alone, right? So that tells us that a lot of us have to learn to integrate these meeting and productivity systems into our businesses. So are you using things like Zoom? Do you have things like Asana where you can assign people work and track if they've finished it or completed that work or not and have these dialogues through these various systems, right? And so these allow you to create efficiencies within you and your teams, but also to track and make sure that the work is being done. So these are things that we all need to start considering, you know, integrated meeting and, and productivity systems. And then the freelance world, you know, Veselina talked about this, but you know, yes. Quick time check. Um, and then also, if you want to have a look at the chat, there are some questions that are coming through that you might want to address as you go along. Is that okay? Oh, okay. I didn't know. I thought we had to wait to the end. No, it's okay. If you just, just cause we're um, just to manage um, time as well. Is that okay? Sure. I think it's I'm best to address it then though, because uh, it will take you more time to read and present at the same time. Yeah? Okay. So let's do it at the end. Perfect. Okay. So, um, Veselina talked a lot about freelancing. So there's so many websites out there, guru.com, freelance.com, where you can sell your skills, right? When I, 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 I've hired a virtual assistants from some of these sites. When I got my book developed, um, you know, my cover art, the editors, all of those came from freelance websites. So from your perspective, what can you sell? What are your skill sets that you can sell to other people? Freelancing is really, really big. A lot of these websites, are, are making you know hundreds of millions of dollars off of people selling their skills. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the knowledge economy. How can you get your piece of that? Whether it's selling products or information or consulting, 
automation. You know, what types of tools are you using in your business that make it easier for you to do business? Chatbots, um, meeting, um, meeting and, and productivity um, services, all in one softwares, and then working remotely. You know, are you set up and equipped to either work from home or to have your teams work from home? And so that's it. You know, I just wanted to give you a taste of the things that I'm seeing in entrepreneurship and small and medium sized businesses. And these are the things that are 5Xing, 10Xing people's businesses, right? These are the things that I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of my clients and the people that I'm interacting with. I know that was quick, but I, I, you know, I really wanted to just give you guys a taste of different things. Thanks, that was actually really, really interesting for me as well. And I'm actually happy to, I don't know, Zaina, you can tell us how we are with time, but I'm happy to make a, a few kind of dialogues between what we discussed and also answer the questions that I have in the, the question box, the chat box. Zaina, we don't hear you, you're still muted. I actually just want to unmute everyone so that they can express their satisfaction to Danny. Danny, that was a presentation rich in information from your experience. Um, really, really appreciate it with Veselina to bring the conversation um, new perspectives and, and new dynamics. I think every single one of us is, I was watching the faces on the screens and we were just all so engaged and some of us taking notes and really, really learning from, um, from you and from, uh, and from Veselina again. Thank you so much. Uh, comment of thanks. Before we go into Q&A, please go ahead. I think it's important. Which one of us on the team is able to mute and unmute? I'm a little um, lost with how we're managing that. I think mm -hmm. they can unmute themselves. Okay. If they, need to, if they need to speak. Okay. Okay. So if you're able to do that, then yes, that means um, that's the case. Okay. So I'll allow you to unmute, which is please unmute yourself. And um, you can give a, a, your, you know, your appreciation remarks to both Danny and Veselina. And as we do that, um, Nancy, you had a couple of questions that came through. And um, so if you'd like to bring those, if you'd like to voice your question. Actually, if, if you would like, I noted a few of the questions in the chat, so I'm happy to respond to those uh, while we're waiting for, for the rest of the organization. Would that work, Zaina? Yeah, for sure. It's um, just with Nancy, I know that she hadn't um, introduced herself, so I wanted to give her the chance to say her question. If she's ready, otherwise... Yeah, she's there. Thank you. My name is Nancy. I'm in the ready? Commonwealth Human Network and I'm in the insurance industry. Uh, like uh, the first speaker talked about the insurance industry having face-to-face um, -face challenge, especially selling life insurance. But you'll see with the Zoom, it's helping us. So in the prospecting area, it's going to take some bit of time. With the second speaker, he talked about reducing touch point for business during the automation. So my, my question was, what are the touch point for a business that automation reduces? Mm -hmm. Am I clear? Maybe. Mm -hmm. I can start with the question you, you asked to me first. Well, uh, then he thinks about his part, yeah? Um, so you, you just mentioned that you, you are um, in the insurance sector and then Zoom meetings have been helping in terms of the face-to-face -face impact. So I'm just going to relate to something very interesting that Danny mentioned in his talk, which was the idea of uh, freelancing and online work and remote work. I was speaking to you a little bit about the information age and the idea of automation and how a lot of our jobs are basically removed because of automation. So in this interesting situation where 
basically the way that the machines we create learn is by gathering as much data as possible about what we do. And now in the COVID situation, we move a lot of the stuff that we physically do into online work, whether it's Zoom, as you're mentioning, or other types of, of, of software that we use to be able to create products and create, like, make actions. So now what's happening is that those machines have access to this additional information. So as we're talking about you moving uh, your work towards Zoom, the next step would be that the machines are going to learn how to do your work and then take that away from you. So that's why we're talking about really finding something you're passionate about, that has impact, so that you can move away from the entire concept of doing jobs that can be easily replicated and do things that bring significant impact to humanity, uh, which in my humble opinion will be the next stage of, of uh, revolution of the technology. Um, hi guys, maybe I, I can say something uh, um, in that front. So I still happen to be a data scientist and um, I'm working, currently working in the insurance space. So I'm unfortunately leading that front when it comes to automation in the insurance sector in uh, Africa. Um, I mean, there are a couple of things that can spin off from this and uh, Danny has spoken into various aspects of how you can sort of reinvent yourself um, to be able to work around um, you know, the changes that we're currently experiencing. Um, but maybe something that can add to the question that Suzanne asked, I, I hope I got the name correctly, is that uh, at the stage of year, we have a bit of time to, to, to transist because most of the automation that is being done uh, mostly requires more and more information. So there's the element of, um, you know, like a quality assurance uh, um, aspect of things that we can still continue to do because they only get as good as the, the machines are so, um, as they're being called, only get as good as um, the expert input that they're being fed with. So it doesn't necessarily say that we, we are immediately going to be knocked off, um, knocked off the, the workspace but it just presents better opportunity in the sense that you get rid of the mundane work and then you act, you know, you start beginning to act as quality assurance and you also further the research because like it has been explained um, and not to belabor the point. So as has been explained, these things learn from data and data and data, but from where we know our knowledge, um, our knowledge progresses is that um, at some point you have to generate better knowledge and more knowledge for you to for us to be able to better both ourselves and also better the machines as we train them so there's still that opportunity where you can move yourself to that um, I don't know if I can call it the fringe of knowledge in your particular area where you try and generate you know newer and newer and newer concepts which you know as time goes fine they will be learned by the machines but you still remain at that front where you still are, you, you know, your, your, your knowledge and your experience can still be utilized. So I think that's probably what I would add in that front. And what um, I was describing is actually what I was referring to as the creator within the impact uh, age framework, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, maybe. But I, I think maybe I can follow up with my question, uh, if, that's, if that's okay. So, um, you know, from my perspective, I think the greatest uh, or the greatest worry for me, um, as I typed in the chat, is that we are experiencing this, uh, this new age, so to speak, the, the, the impact age. And the worry is that the generations that are coming after us, so our children and our grandchildren, how do we then best prepare them to, you know, to be able to transist from what we currently are to what the expectations will be after, you know, after the full transition to the, to the impact age. Because for us, we have the benefit that we are still going to be able to leave both, uh, both, 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 both uh, periods, so to speak. But then it's quite likely that by the time my son grows up, then um, what I know as work will completely have changed. But then the education systems as they are, don't necessarily are not necessarily preparing them for that. And even ourselves, we don't have enough knowledge to prepare them for that, that transition. So it's a question around 
how do we then get you know that that shift in mindset and training for the next generations for them to be able to be ready for 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 this new um sort of way of life and way of working that kind of thing well i think what i think it's about finding something you're passionate about and thinking about the impact that you want to make right when you come at it from a place of service where i want to help people as much as i can then the money will come back to you and that's exactly what's been happening for me i just it's just about finding out who you are and what you stand for see we do it the traditional way we go to school to become a doctor a lawyer an engineer right now we have to start thinking about what is it that you're passionate about what type of impact do you want to make your clients are all over the world right i have clients in all kinds of different countries and so i just focus on serving more right serving more and then people start to say well what what can i buy from you and that's why i like the knowledge in the information age because you can sell your knowledge and you combine your knowledge and your skill set with your passion then you can you you can reach people all over the world right and, and i think that's a good place for people to start not just focusing on what traditional jobs not focusing on you know it's really about starting with what are you passionate about i just told you this guy one of my clients is that he plays guitar he teaches people how to play guitar and he's making 150 to 250,000 dollars a year just through having an online membership right because that's what he loves I mean, to do yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe. i think this is this is very good sorry uh, maybe as a last uh, contribution on this particular um, area so i think i think this is a very good um, mindset true and uh, unfortunately it's not everybody who's exposed to such you know to 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 such information so it's more around the question of how you know there's there's a million or a billion a couple of billions of people in the planet and majority of them being from the upcoming generation so how do you make a systemic change not necessarily individually but a systemic change towards being able to 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 achieve this because otherwise yes we'll end up you know the the few of us who are fortunate enough to have this thought provoking moments and discussions being able to do that but then what happens to to the rest yeah so it's more around think, systemic change thank you because that is really good at the practical side of things so i love this so i'm happy to take a bit more of the theoretical uh, approach to answering that question which is about you know just basically how education can evolve uh to answer to the needs that are coming and i think one of the major things we need to understand is that knowledge is no longer uh the commodity of education it's just no longer is we're in a place where knowledge is very easily accessible so you don't go to a school to get knowledge that's not what you do you go to a school to get maybe skills to find yourself you know to network these are the things that education provides to you today and when it comes to networking i think this is what school is still very good at and will continue to be good at we have also seen a global change in the education sector where there's a big movement towards more of a skill based education rather than you know just cramming knowledge and learning how to learn rather than you know learning by heart so we have a lot of these things already slowly happening and you have to understand that education has always been slow to catch up uh just because it teaches you the past it's just how it is structured while what you need what you're asking is how do we teach our children about the future and the truth is that probably what happened to us is going to happen uh to the next generation where we ended up teaching our parents how to use cell phones so maybe next thing our now 3 year old son is going to come to us and teach us how to use the newest gadgets to i don't know uh no idea what the future is going to hold there so i think there's a lot of of that that is going to be at the forefront of education and as you were saying um it's a sort of process i don't think that everybody is going to catch up at the same time and people who are in currently more privileged situations are going to continue carrying that privilege by the fact that they'll be able to take their kids to schools where their imagination is being fostered or their um you know the creativity is being encouraged while some kids in uh, rural Kenya will still be struggling to sit on the tree to just learn how to sum and and subtract so we have these big disparities and that's why the concept of the impact age is really crucial because if then we're able to carry those changes that are already happening to other places in the world so that education can be better quality uh, at least we have a minimum education even if it's not preparing you exactly for the, for the age we are we are looking at as coming to 
Um, so yeah, so this is what is going to be important. So I think the individual choices have a really big role to play uh, in how this is going to play out. And if you want to be a, an ambassador under my uh, little impact age framework, then this is uh, one of the topics that you could be pushing um, in your daily actions, how to make sure that uh, education is provided to places um, more like ubiquitously around the globe in a way that's going to prepare the kids for a time where creativity, um, compassion, and uh, just basic flexibility are going to be way more useful than, uh, you know, uh, learning who conquered the Roman Empire in that year, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, Veselina, that's great. Thank you. Um, I also see big organizations like YouTube, uh, Amazon, Apple, podcast, um, um, these big organizations pushing education forward. LinkedIn, I see them start, they're already partnering up with organizations, but now I see them starting to partner up with the education sector. And so I think it's big organizations like Amazon because of their books and their video, audio books and all these things. I think it's YouTube. I think um, Apple with podcasts and all those things. I think they're going to start to influence the education sector, right? These are billion trillion dollar companies, right? So you can already see it um, with, um, with COVID. Um, I think it was uh, Amazon that said that all children's books would be accessible for free during this, this pandemic, right? So that's one way that they're starting to say, okay, getting people introduced to children's books through Amazon, right? So you're already starting to see them warming up the education sector. So I, that's what I think. I think that it'll be these big organizations that start to influence education and move towards skill-based, right? Like how do you start a podcast that reaches 100 million people? How do you start to write books? How do you start to do these creative things? And guess what? You can monetize on our platforms. So that's just one of the things that I think is probably going to happen. It's interesting. I mean, YouTube tutorials are basically about that. Yeah? It's what we're seeing. And you have platforms like edX. And if you look into the chat that is happening currently in, in this, uh, I see that Marwa and a few people are pouring ideas around uh, lifelong learning learning as a continuous process. And I think that would be, again, to come back to Kelvin's question, that would be one of the new tenants of, of education is that education doesn't need to be your standard thing. And that's why education institutions are, are struggling right now a lot uh, because they have to basically reinvent themselves and education as a, it's like the, maybe the first thing you call institution because it's really, really established. Uh, so it's not something that is used to changing. So we have this, this very interesting age we're into. And people in the education sector will have to have some hard questions. Otherwise, as I said, very quick to market startups are coming up. So if your sector is not ready, somebody else will be. That's kind of where we are. So we might end up educating our uh, children in a very different fashion than what we're seeing today, just because the next startup, which is going to re revolutionize the sector, is around the corner and we haven't seen it. Awesome. And I think that one of the things, Veselina, what you said about educating our children, that there's a big role that we must play as that generation and our, and our parents even, because they say it takes a village, right? Um, and I think that we cannot just simply rely on formal education. Kids now are Googling everything. They're, you know, on YouTube to learn how to play guitar or whatever it is. And I think one of the best things that we can do is role model the right behaviors, accept failure, and also encourage them to be whatever passion they want to pursue. As Danny said, we can't just say doctors, lawyers, and engineers. I'm married to an engineer, my sister's married to a doctor, and they're both in completely different sectors right now, doing completely different things. One selling t-shirts and one is feeding children and you know, developing world. And you know, yeah. I graduated political science and I'm a trainer. So I think one of the things is to embrace a growth mindset where we accept failure, we continue to grow, we continue to move forward and learn new things because we can't even predict now what's happening. Even doctors who've graduated with a degree must continually learn and improve their skills. If they stay where they are, then they're going to get way behind. So. Interesting twist to what you said. What you said about parents being educators is 100% true and also 100% problematic, uh, at least right now because it means we have so much demands on parents and my, my husband and I, we're in a very lucky position that we actually are not struggling to feed our family. 
So this is, um, you know, so we have the, the luxury, and that's what Kelvin was mentioning, what a, it's just the few who have these insights or this um, inborn um, privilege that are able to, to you know, educate the children for the future. But you have the very poor who are struggling to make ends meet, where the children have to uh, work as child labor so that they're able to complement the family budget. So we are really in a situation where even that mindset of saying, well, it's going to have to fall on the parents, this is something that is really enlarging the poverty, the, the wealth gap yeah, between poverty and, and wealth. So it's, it's again one of these very big questions that as a society we need to ask ourselves, and if this is the passion that you're passionate about, you have to think of your small way uh, of how you can uh, make an impact on, on that scenario. I think the, the exchange of questions and the, 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 the wisdom with which the answers have been provided is uh, truly exceptional. And I believe that that's one of the reasons that we have gone uh, well over time today, but we really didn't want to stop the conversation first because of your generosity, Danny and Veselina, of, of, of time, giving your time to us. Um, and two, because there seem, you know, we, we've been seeing the, the nods and the, and the expressions on the, on the participants' faces, and I think that there's really um, something that everybody is gaining from this. Um, so I would um, like to encourage uh, that perhaps we start um, closing up, and then we will leave the place, we will leave the room open for anybody who wants to network and continue to introduce themselves. I know that there's the facility for private messaging, so please um, do reach out to um, anybody that you've heard from that you know you can help, that you know um, could help you. Um, and this is, the, this is now more than ever is the time for that, the time to respect what we're able to contribute across different cultures and across different continents. And I would say that today we have at least seven different um, countries represented on this chat from across the global south. So that is... Um, you know, that's a tremendous, uh, tremendous um, opportunity for synergy and for idea building and for um, impact generating and even the creation of new enterprises if you're thinking of expanding. Um, um, I, I do want to ask um, specifically if uh, Dr. Ojiambo has something uh, to share with us today. I know that you said you would give us your video and, I, and we see you, so thank you so much. Yeah. No, it, it's really been, been a lovely sharing. I mean, it's challenged me on many fronts. Uh, it's, been, it's been lovely to hear the reflections on personal development and how we can rethink education. For me, that's been really a number one eye-opener. And I actually want to say that, you know, one of our colleagues, Nancy, from the Commonwealth Business Women's Network has introduced herself. We at the network would be delighted if, um, and uh, of course, asking Zaina, if uh, you are able to give us, um, you know, some an hour or two of this, and Zaina would be so delighted if you could bring uh, Stone and Barcelona together with us, because our network is really more than just a Kenyan chapter. It's a chapter that uh, exists in Nigeria, in London, in Australia, and we'd be we'd be happy to get the branches together and ask you to give us some personal time. But I also felt individually challenged because I hear very many young people come to me today and more so now asking about how they can, you know, how they can engage in, the, in work. And um, I've listened today and I would really be personally empowered by a, another deeper conversation on how you can facilitate others because I think this is something that we are all challenged with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I find young people come and say, would you mentor us? And so you do end up mentoring in the skill you have but you're not able to prepare them for the job sector, the job market. And young people are continually disappointed because they think maybe there's something you didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. It's really more about how to engage. It's more about how to market yourself, attitude, yeah. and all that, just how you express yourself with others. And that's a skill that I'd like to know if we can share a little more, be very, very useful. Um, I have a lot more I want to ask, but I don't think that it would suffice if I did go into some of those particulars right now. But I think uh, Zaina, it's been a lovely engagement. I look forward to engaging further. I'd like to know how we can move some of these products into the UN South-South program centrally mm -hmm. and see how we can move forward in that manner. Yes, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. Stay in touch.
Thank you, and thank you for, for bringing to the forefront your, um, your observations, your, your perceptions. My um, answer to the question on uh, whether this is something that we could do um, together with the Commonwealth Business uh, Women's Network. Before, uh, D uh, when Danny Veselina and I were actually planning for this session, we had talked about doing a series because we saw so much of it um, could lead to um, you know, next conversations. So we'll take that up after this and we'll definitely, um, I think that kind of a collaboration uh, where we can reach as many people as possible um, would be excellent. So between, between our organization, South South Women and the Commonwealth Business uh, Women's Network. Thank so you. That on. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you, I can see that um, perhaps they're willing to give a bit more of their time. So if you do have a question that you'd like to ask that you think would um, benefit the, the participation here, please go ahead. Maybe I'll just uh, take um, one minute um, of your time because uh, I really have to drop, but I stuck in because I just needed to make a comment, a very quick comment. Uh, I come from a technology world. Um, I don't know if you can see me well. And um, everything that Danny, I've just put comments all down there. Everything that Danny and Vaselena spoke are uh, things that um, can very easily be transformed into or can be enabled by technology. And for me, one of the things that we're having a challenge with and which we have to consider is to do with security, particularly around technology, because technology has enabled and uh, helped us to progress a lot in speed of delivery, as well as getting knowledge, all round knowledge. Right now, I, when, I, when I listen to them, I'm just uh, in, uh, getting a lot of knowledge about what they do and how it can help me personally. Okay, I wouldn't have this benefit without the advantage of this technology that we're having. And therefore, um, unfortunately, we've got other people who have other ideas and they would jump into this meeting. This is a closed meeting by invitation but you find they have access to such a meeting and they use the information that they get from here for other purposes. We must be able to ring fence what we do, okay? And as we talked about children, okay? And what they can use, how they can use technology to improve themselves. We must be able to also protect our children from the vulnerabilities of the cyber world. Okay, I, I have a lot that I can contribute onto this. Um, Vaselina in her talking in, in her in her presentation talked about uh, artificial intelligence. We've got virtual reality. We've got machine learning. All those factors. Danny talked about uh, repeatable acts, or rather, uh, in fact, I noted it down. The automation about where you have. Um, talking points where you have recorded speeches uh, or responses uh, by equipment so that they can respond to you quicker as a customer. In machine learning, we develop understanding, our equipment develops understanding of your needs as a customer and can be able to help you or help the company get the insights on your likes, dislikes, your character, your moods and everything. And by that, when you come online, you're frustrated about a call, let's say you're talking to your tech company, your, your telco, they frustrated you on something, your mood, how you speak, it captures that mood and transfers that call to a human who can then handle you more on a human level, okay? So all these things are about machine learning. Yes, technology is there to help us uh, do better, but uh, I just wanted to reiterate that I don't think technology is here to replace the jobs that exist, okay? What we are, the world is expanding. And therefore, more jobs are being created. But the machines are there to help us improve and be more efficient in how we deliver our services. I think let me stop at that. Okay. I would very much like to be in part of this group. This is an excellent group. Initially, when I was here, I was blue. I wasn't sure what the South South, and it said women. I said, okay, let me find out what this is all about. But uh, generally speaking, going having gone through this, I'm um, terribly impressed, thoroughly impressed, uh, and, and I'm leaving um, now uh, with a lot more than I got or a lot more than I bargained for when I came in. I appreciate it, uh, Vaselina. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I would uh, be very happy to participate in others which maybe uh, have some flavor of technology so that maybe I might contribute a thing or two. Okay, thank you very much. And, you know, we thank you so much for staying until the end and for your contribution. And what we mean by South South Women is that it's women led. 
we saw opportunities for women to lead, um, you know, uh, the creation of uh, possibilities in business, in impact, in, in, in every sector that is of mutual benefit to countries of the global south. So it will be- Well, thank more. you very much. In fact, I got that very clearly. Um, Sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. I got that very clearly. And in fact, where I, I wanted to interject and say about that particular thing when you say about women-led is I always have conversations. I have got two teenage sons. One is uh, just turned 18 three days ago and another one is 16. And one of the things that I have conversation with them all the time is that first, if you have a girlfriend, you cannot have love without respect, okay? It's not possible. You can have respect without love, but you cannot have the other way around. So if he's, she is your girlfriend, you must learn to respect. And respect, part of respect is part of giving her attention, listening to what she says and making sense out of it, and allowing her to make suggestions that make sense that are acceptable. So this is part of what one of the conversations we have, because we are in Africa here. African way of looking at things and women is very different from culturally, I mean, it's very different from the way the West looks at things. So we must be able to see each other. We are, we are, not, we are not talking about, um, when, when people come and argue that uh, women empowerment is about equality, I say, okay, but let's be careful about this equality word. When we get married or get into a relationship, we come as, um, you're coming to complement each other. Okay, everybody has got their part to play and their weight to carry. So we complement each other. It's very important that when the other party you're speaking and the other party is listening, allow them a contribution into a thing and together you're more powerful, right? I like it. Now, just, just kind of to quickly uh, uh, relate this to something I was speaking about earlier. I was speaking about um, altruistic egoism. So the idea that uplifting others is actually beneficial to, you, beneficial to yourself directly in the current uh, environment we live in. So, of course, when I was talking about uplifting the poor or, um, you know, marginalized groups, racism, uh, sexism, these are also concerns that, if alleviated, would bring you personally or whoever you are personally um, a positive, positive impact just because of how society is structured and works in the information age. And I would agree. I think that, you know, during all this COVID time, I decided that I just wanted to give more. And so I just started um, going live on Instagram three times a week, just, just giving people information, tools to help them manage through this time, tools to, you know, start thinking about how to be more productive, how to prepare for post COVID. And as a result, I landed seven clients, you know, three organizations and four people hired me as a coach, but it was just a consistency in giving, right? I started bringing on my friends who were sharing tips and so on. And so I recommended that to a few other people and this is the exact same thing happened to them. One of my friends was a real estate agent. He just started going live. Um, um, another friend of ours, Zaina from Ethiopia, Meiti. Meiti mm -hmm. started going live every single day and she's really built this, this massive following because of the consistency. And so you're right, it's a, just about giving, just making a choice to give and to help and people see that and they're like, well, what can I buy from you? What, how can I get, go deeper with you? And that's kind of what's happened with me over the last two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think an important learning, and again, I'm going to be the devil's advocate all the time, uh, is that we here are very privileged because not everybody's in a position to actually have extra time during COVID. Maybe you're really struggling to end, make ends meet. Maybe you're in a situation where you can't give. Maybe you're so stressed because somebody in your family is, is sick or, or passed because of COVID. So um, I don't think we should be very careful not to tell people that, you know, right now is the time to, you know, if you don't give back to the community, you're doing the wrong thing because everybody's situation is really personal. But if you can, and if you're in a psychological state where you are able to, you'll be surprised what kind of knowledge and what kind of uh, abilities you have to, to give back. It can be something really, um, you know, just kind of think of what your skills or expertise are. It doesn't need to be in the knowledge economy. You can just contact an organization which is in line with what you believe in. And you can support them with accounting or you can support them with whatever, you know, your, your thing is. For example, I, um, with Oxford Business, we had to scale down operations uh, right now in the interim 
because of COVID and uh, I found myself with some extra time. So I'm donating some time to KIPSA because they are working um, in, in an area where they're trying to influence policy in um, you know, how the government is going to reopen the market. So these are some ways which, again, I'm coming from a very privileged position and I'm not denying that. Uh, but if you are in such a similar privileged position, don't, don't wonder, just look around, think what your skills are and which organizations can make the most impact with your skills. And just uh, proactively um, contact them and, and you know, try to donate your skills. And, and I'd like to add to that. I think one other thing too, Veselina, is really checking in with yourself and your family. You know, maybe there's, you, you can't, you don't have this platform, but really checking in with yourself during difficult times and say, where am I being open and honest with yourself? Are you checking on other people in your household to see how they're doing? Are you reaching out by phone to your friends and your family as well? That's another way that we can continue to look out for each other in, in the same, you know, and still kind of do our part to make sure that we're okay and they're okay as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think those are amazing um, remarks to possibly close with. And, and what we've done here, um, of course, the theme has been rethinking enterprise. We've brought up rethinking education. We've brought about rethinking our um, intention. Uh, you know, something I call, uh, you know, resetting our intention to service. Um, and that's where the future is going. Whether we're thinking about the kind of future we're providing our children, for out of who we are developing ourselves to become, the kind of future that we are providing to um, our younger generations, especially when you think about 80% of the Africa population being um, under the age of uh, 30. Um, and we're, and we're, we're really recreating at this stage um, what we want our future to look like. Um, so these are, these are fundamental uh, questions that we've addressed here based in science, based in personal experience, um, and based on our creative capacity as human beings to be able to think to the future, not predict, but think to the future. And my sense is that if we were starting to base our five-year plans um, on the kind of people we want to become, we would be ready to handle anything. If our five-year plans as organizations and as people five years ago was, was based on that. The focus was who do you want to be in five years time, not where do you want to be or what do you want to have? We, would, we could have been handling today very distinct. And that's, that's the kind of conversation that we want to continue contributing wisdom to and the kind of uh, legacy that collectively across the global South, we want to be building. So thank you all very much today for your time, for your energy and your exceptional energy to, um, to Danny and uh, Veselina for staying longer. Um, for all our, to all our participants, I know some of them have left, but you'll all be receiving an email from us, from Nigeria, from um, Kenya, from the Netherlands, from, uh, from the UK. Uh, um, Brazil. I think that's all that's left. Yeah. yeah, from Bulgaria, from Peru, <laughs> from Argentina. So um, thank you and see you next Monday for a session that Marwa will be conducting with Fernando from Mexico on Amplify Your Voice Part 2. Hey, awesome. Thanks a lot, Zayn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very thank much. You. And, uh, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so bye -bye. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the family of Veselina for being with us today. <laughs> About the whole family. And to mine, who's actually listening from the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Good to see you. All right, I'm saying bye as well. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. One second. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Beatrice. Bye, Beatrice. Nice to meet. You. Nice to meet you. Bye bye. It was very interesting. I want to connect. Thank <laughs> you.
with all of you anytime. Thank you. Eh? Please join us next Monday. Bye. -bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next yes. Monday also. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Marwa, I, I can't find how to end the, the meeting. At the bottom right corner, is there leave? It's because it's, I'm just trying to do it. Spanish. Work it out. There's a lot of changes, I think. Yeah.